Hannah gives us hope that if God will not do that great thing in your life, He will surely do it in the life of your children and grandchildren. But there is a part that God wants you to play and we need to understand what is it that He wants to impregnate us with in these last days for His glory. Don't be an empty Christian. You go to church like a shell, you come out like a shell, you come back in like a shell, but be filled with God's purposes. Have a reason why you come to church and why are you travailing? Have a reason why you are praying. Have a reason why are you crying out to God? Have a reason why you are worshiping. And don't let God go until, Lord God, you fulfill what you said you want to do in my life. You may be seated. It is good to greet everyone this Sunday morning to see all of you. Well, before we want to get into the Word of God, please allow me to take a few minutes to show you two one-minute video and to give a testimony of what the Lord is doing. First of all, I want to give the warmest regards from Dr. Stephen. He's ministering in Conroe, Texas. In the next two days, he will travel to Laredo, Texas to minister at Warriors for Christ, our sister church. Pray that their church conference will really be a blessing. It will be a great encouragement and strength to the body of Christ in Laredo. And also, I want to give you, uh, I want to say thank you for all the prayers for my family. Josephine, Eliana, and baby is doing very well. They miss the church, but they're tuning in online. I believe she's tuning in online right now. So thank you for all the prayers. And I want to testify of what the Lord uh, has done in Indonesia. Uh, somebody say with me, the kingdom of God is marching on. The kingdom of God is marching Hallelujah. on. Can I get the slideshow on? I have a wonderful praise report to the church family that our office in Indonesia is now in the process of renovating our office space. God has supernaturally provided the money for us to get started. We still need more funds, but it is getting there. Can we get the slides, Colin? Is it up? It is a photo of, of how the office is going to look like. Do we have it or not? It is the PDF file. Ben, can you help Colin, please? So, okay, there it is. Can you go to page, uh, page number seven? Keep on scrolling. This is a view of how our sanctuary will look like. It, it can only now house 50 to 60 people. What is amazing is that the ministry in Indonesia is run mostly by youth. And so they are ministering, touching lives, discipling. And so we're believing that this sanctuary will be ready. And for the use for God's glory, well, it will be a prophetic training center that we can declare the word of the Lord for the nation of Indonesia. Okay? And I want to show you a one-minute video. It's one of the youth retreat. Uh, that took place just a few weeks ago in Manado. So you can see the horizontal one first of what the Lord is doing. And the second video I want to show you of a conference where I was speaking. Why I want to show that video? Because next year in the month of February, so church, please pray. Dr. Stephen Francis and team, we will be in Indonesia to conduct the first Prepare Conference Indonesia 2024. Yeah. Where we are believing more than 500 pastors and leaders not only in Indonesia, but surrounding nations, they will come. And we believe it will become a prophetic hub to hear the word of God for 2024 and beyond. Somebody say amen. amen. And God willing, I am now in the process of coordinating with uh, some local churches where we also will have a youth conference. And we are believing a minimum of 1,500 youth will be gathered to hear the word of the Lord. Okay, can we have the video? This is the first video. I want this to be a testimony so that the church family in Shelby knows that the ministry that God has given through Dr. Stephen Francis to lead and all the sister churches, what we are doing globally, you are taking part through your prayers, through the seed that you are sowing. So for the glory of God, first video, let's show it.
That meeting happened for it almost close to midnight and three youth experienced instant healing in their body. Nobody laid hands on them. They were just praying for one another and people were throwing up everywhere. They were being delivered from demonic powers over their life. Amen. The second video is another one minute. It is the location where we will have our conference with Dr. Stephen next February. So be praying. But I just want to show you this clip so you have a visual. Amen. So next February, keep it in your prayers. God is doing something in Indonesia and all around the world. Amen. Amen. Let's open our Bible together. The book of Revelation chapter 12, verse 1 to verse 6. The title of my message this morning, this is what the Lord has laid in my heart. The title is Connected in the House of God. It is important for God's people to be connected in the house of God. A lot of people go to church. You can be a member of a certain church, but you are disconnected. You can sit on the pews every Sunday, but you're disconnected. It's important God is inviting you and I in these end times to be connected to the flow of the Spirit in His house. If not, people can come to church, leave the church. People come to church, no transformation in your life. You don't do anything for God's glory. You don't touch souls. And then the church becomes a consumer mentality a bunch of people who comes and we're always asking what can the church do for me instead of what can I contribute to the house of God it is important for the church to be connected it is important for all the generations in the church to be connected now a lot of people are divided the youth think they can move on their own they can do things on their own The older generation, you can't connect with the youth. You don't know the language that the youth is speaking. There is a disconnect in the church. Why with all the testimonies with the youth, do you know that what what God is doing in Rivers of Life Apostolic, it will not die in one generation, but it will come to generation after generation after generation for the glory of God. We are going to see our sons and daughters come up. We're going to see our sons and daughters touched by the power of God. They will walk in their God-given destiny for such a time as this. And I want to impart and share to all of you that what God is doing in the lives of the young people that you see on the screen, that can also happen to your children and your grandchildren. That will happen to your grandbabies. That will happen to your babies. But if you are here, get connected and plugged in to what God is doing. Revelation chapter 12 verse 1 to verse 6. I will read it for all of us. The Bible says, and a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet and on her head, a crown of 12 stars. She was pregnant and was crying out in birth pains and the agony of giving birth. And another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great red dragon with seven heads and 10 horns and on his head, seven diadems. His tail swept down a third of the stars of heaven and cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth so that when she bore her child, he might devour it. She gave birth to a male child, one who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. But her child was caught up to God and to his throne. And the woman fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared by God in which she is to be nourished for 1,200.
260 days. Go back to verse 1. I understand that this scripture, the woman speaks of the nation Israel. But a few weeks ago in Indonesia, the Lord gave me an understanding of this scripture that I want to share to all of us. First of all, it is interesting. The Bible says a great sign appeared in heaven. Somebody say with me, a great sign. I want to remind us, church, that the last day's church has been called and commissioned by God to be a great sign for this world. Touch your neighbor and say, you are a sign and a wonder. A say it again. You are a sign and a wonder. Do you realize that? That the church of Jesus Christ in these end times, we are not people struggling to live and survivors. But the Bible says we are a great sign that will appear in the end times to declare that our God who was and is and is to come, whose name is Jesus Christ, he is the living God. He is Alpha and he is Omega. Somebody say amen. amen. Some people say that this particular portion of the book of Revelation speaks of Mary giving birth to the Lord Jesus. No. Because everything in the book of Revelation is shown to John by God for the future. It is not telling of past event. God was showing to John what is to take place in the future. And the Bible says a great sign appeared. When you look in the next few verses where the great dragon or the red dragon appear, the Bible did not say that the dragon is also a great sign. The Bible simply said another sign. I'm here to tell you no matter what the devil can do in these end times, the devil is only a counterfeit and he's not the superstar. The superstar is the Lord Jesus Christ and his bride. The superstar is the great sign that God is unleashing in these end times to prepare the way for the coming of the King of glory. Somebody say amen. A great sign appeared in heaven. A woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head, a crown of 12 stars. The next verse. The Bible says in the next verse. She was pregnant and was crying out in birth pains and the agony of giving birth. This particular verse caught my attention. The Bible says that this woman whom God called a great sign is pregnant. And the Lord began to speak and God is saying, what is my church conceiving in these end times? What are you conceiving in your spirit? I give many testimonies um, many times when Eliana was born, one of the effect that happened to me personally is I loved my wife Josephine even more. That was an effect for me. When I saw her hold the baby for the first time, I began to cry and I loved her. I couldn't explain, but the expression of love that was bubbling up inside of me was different. And you know, the Lord says, that's you. Do you know how I feel when my church is pregnant with my will? Do you know how I feel when my church gives birth to her destiny? Do you know how happy I am when my children fulfills their assignment? Do you know how happy I am when my people are producing generations that know my name? Because the Bible says that the knowledge of God will be passed down from generation to generation. That's what happens with the children of Israel. What God did in the life of their patriarchs and matriarchs, it's passed down from one generation to the next generation. And you know, it is sad that in these last days, the church has neglected this concept of discipleship. We have neglected this concept that whether you are a pastor or not, you have a responsibility to produce the next generation, your sons and your daughters, your grandchildren, to know God and to be deep with God. It is your responsibility. God is looking for a church who's pregnant in these last days. You know, if you are not going to be pregnant with the will of God, if you're not going to be pregnant with the mind of God, with the concerns of God, you cannot be the prophetic generation that you want. Because the Bible says she was pregnant and was crying out. Somebody say with me, crying out. The prophetic anointing is released over a people who know the vision that comes from heaven. God is not looking for stray rockets who just loves to prophesy to people because you're trying to show off your gift. The prophetic anointing is incomplete if the prophetic anointing does not match with the vision that comes from God. That's why a lot of people can only move in the gifts, but their life have no direction. 
The gifts of the Spirit is not for us to show off. The gift of the Spirit is given to empower you to fulfill what God wants to birth inside of you. The Bible says she was pregnant, was crying out in birth pains and the agony of giving birth. What does that speak of? The art of prayer and travailing. God is about to release a fresh prayer anointing. Dr. Stephen has declared that a school of prayer is coming. But I'm telling you, when that school of prayer is coming, when the next level of prophetic anointing is given, be sure you know exactly what is God's dream for you. Be sure that your womb in the spirit is not empty, but you're carrying the will of God and you're birthing the will of God. Can somebody say amen? Amen. God is looking for a church that is pregnant, pregnant with God's will, pregnant with God's mind. Are we even concerned with the will of God? I asked this in Indonesia. When was the last time you pray that God will protect your children? Some people might say earlier this morning or yesterday. But when was the last time you prayed, oh God, give me eyes to see and ears to hear so I know what your spirit is saying. People don't even pray that. Why? It's not important. The Bible says a woman. The word woman in the Greek is the word gyne, G-Y-N-E, which means wife or betrothed to someone. I believe the book of Revelation chapter 12, it speaks of the different Types of churches that will rise up in these end times. Victorious. The mature church of Jesus Christ. There will be a company of sons and daughters. Who will walk in the fullness of God's authority. There will be those that are called to prepare this next generation. There will be those that will be prepared to fight as the last day's remnant. But the word woman there, the word woman means wife of someone. And interestingly enough, it is the same word used by the Lord Jesus Christ in the book of John chapter 2 verse 4. Can we open that scripture? The first miracle that the Lord Jesus did. And Jesus said to Mary, his own mother. What did he say? Woman, what does this have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. And the word woman that the Lord Jesus used means wife of someone. Even though Mary was his mother that God gave as a custodian to raise the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus says, woman, God, Jesus was saying, Mary, you who are betrothed to someone. And I believe Mary speaks of the representation of the mature church of Jesus Christ. Do you realize there is something powerful in John chapter 2? The first miracle took place because a mother understood and recognized the call that her son has. And the miracle took place because a son honored the request of a mother. What is that? A connected generation. The miracle came. Because of a mother who recognized the call of God in her son's life. In the same manner, the Lord Jesus Christ honored the mother whom God has appointed to be in charge over his life to raise him up. I tell you that's how powerful your family is. If parents and children can collaborate together. And I'm not only talking about physical parents, but spiritual parents. A spiritual family. If you know how to get connected with the vision of the house, you're not just here as a member. You can accept Dr. Stephen Francis as a preacher, but can you accept him as your spiritual father? A lot of people can't. Because you just come to church to hear another sermon. Unless you are connected to the heart of God. That miracle won't come forth. But because of one statement from Mary... Something was provoked inside the Lord Jesus. And the miracle took place. Something wonderful. In the book of John chapter 2 verse 10 to verse 11. Watch this. 
after all that the Lord Jesus instructed for the servants to do, and the miracle took place, the servants said, or the people in the party said to the Lord Jesus, everyone serves the good wine first. And when people have drunk freely, then the poor wine. But you have kept the good wine until now. Verse 11. This, the first of the signs, of his signs, Jesus did at Cana in Galilee and manifested his glory. Underline that. And his disciples believed him. Oh, I tell you. The miracle of water turning into wine was not just for the party to enjoy the party. You know what happened? That miracle was the first contact point of planet earth seeing the manifested glory of God through Jesus. And number two, you know what happened? The disciples who later changed the world, the disciples who began the work where God established his church, this was the moment when they believed in God. I tell you, church, do you know? That you and I in these end times, we are the best wine reserved by God for planet earth. Somebody say amen. You are the best wine. We are the best wine. We are the best that this world will see. We are the best that this world will experience. And what will happen? We will manifest the glory of God. And manifesting the glory will go hand in hand with what? Lives being transformed and they meeting Christ. Because of this one miracle, the 12 disciples who followed Christ Jesus, they believed in him and the rest is history. It was in this moment. And because of one, because of one woman who said to the Lord Jesus, they ran out of wine. That's the power of a mature church. You don't pray carelessly. You don't ask carelessly. You know that when you open your mouth, the Lord Jesus will respond to you. Can somebody say amen? Amen. We're talking about an authority that we got no clue what it's about and God is about to review. But what is needed, somebody say with me, maturity. You got to be connected to the source. I will speak of this the next time. Do you remember before Elisha was meeting with Elijah, and Elijah was about to take him up to heaven. Elijah said to Elisha, what do you want? For me, that is a strange question. Because the calling of Elisha to become the prophet after Elijah was not given by Elijah. God gave him that call. Correct? God told Elijah, you anoint Elisha because he will become prophet after you. So why in the world did Elijah have to ask Elisha, what do you want? You know what Elisha wanted? Elisha did not want the call because he knows he got the call. What did Elisha ask from Elijah? I want a double portion. Of what? Elijah's anointing? Huh? No, read it carefully. That's why a lot of Christians are addicted to being laid hands. A lot of Christians are addicted to getting prophesied. Elisha never asked for Elijah's anointing. I want a double portion of your spirit. Not anointing. Spirit! What is spirit? Spirit means lifestyle. Spirit means how you walk with God. I want to walk like you. How you commune with God. I want to commune like you. Not anointing. I want a double portion of your spirit. And if you read... In the book of 1 Kings, carefully, Elisha never asked or Elisha never said, give it to me. Elisha said, let me inherit. Somebody say with me, inherit, Inherit. not impart. There are some things in God does not come to you by the laying of hands. You got to inherit it. You cannot inherit if you're not willing to walk. You're not going to inherit if you're not willing to pay the price. You're not going to inherit if you're not willing to be patient. You're not going to inherit unless you stick close and get connected to the source, which is Almighty God. Amen. Don't think just because you come to Jesus, my King, automatically you become prophetic. No. You have to be connected. Somebody say with me, connected. Connected to the house of God. If you are connected, you're not going to wait until your pastor gives you a position in church. 
If you are connected, you're not waiting to be recognized. If you are connected, you're willing to give and sow and say, what can I do to build God's house? Before I met Dr. Stephen Francis, I have begun the work in Indonesia. Why? That's the vision God gave me. You see that? A lot of people want connections, but they don't want to get connected. Having connections and being connected is absolutely different. God brought a father in my life. His name is Dr. Stephen Francis. But the vision that was birthed inside of me was birthed by Almighty God. I cannot piggyback on Dr. Stephen. I can't. That's why people have the wrong mentality. You treat men and women of God to become like gods over your life. But you got nothing to show for God. Because our womb, our spiritual womb is empty. Do you understand what I'm saying here, church? But get connected in each and every one of you that is a vision from God. When you are brought by God to this house, you pick up the vision. You pick up what God is doing. It will give you a transfusion so that what God is birthing inside of you, it will come into fruition. You are being equipped, prepared. You are being weaponized by God. So that what is birthed from you can make impact for God's glory. Can somebody say amen? Amen. You ask this yourself. Do you know what's your vision? Do you know what God has called you to do? Do you know why you're alive? If you don't know and you've been in church for 20 years, you're in big trouble. It's time to get connected. Because God is preparing a great sign in these last days. You and I are called to be signs and wonders for His glory. Amen? Go back to Revelation chapter 12. Let's continue. Verse 3. And another sign appeared in heaven. It says, behold, a great red dragon with seven heads and ten horns. And in on his head, seven diadems. The Lord spoke to me. Be careful. I want to show you four things that we need to be careful of. Why is it important to be connected in the house of God? Why is it to be important to be connected to the spirit of the house, to the vision of the house? Why is it important when you're part of a church family to protect one another, to help one another, to steward one another? Why? Because you know the Bible says that this devil, he has seven heads. That's the characteristic of the devil. In the body of Christ, we only have one head. And who's his name? Jesus Christ. Be careful of disunity. Imagine having seven heads. Seven minds speaking. In other words, you know what God is saying in these end times? Be careful of your own opinions. There is a place for your opinions and there is a place. Shut your opinions because your opinions does not matter. Number two, ten horns. Horns are used by animals as a means for self-defense and protection. And the Lord says, you know, what the devil will use is what? When you are selfish, pursuing your own ambition in the expense of another person. Be careful of that. This is the wiles of the enemy in these last days. Number three, and on his heads, seven Diadems. What is that? It speaks of conceited and self-glorification. That's why Jesus, the Lord Jesus, teaches us. You want to be the greatest? You put others first. Because the devil is different. He's conceited and he wants all the glory to himself. Verse 4. His tail swept down a third of the stars of heaven... And cast them to the earth. This was not when Lucifer fell and brought a third of the angels. No. Because this is speaking of future. You know what will happen? Many stars. God's people. Churches. Leaders. They will fall. 
And you know what takes them out? Not the mouth of a dragon, the tail of a dragon. Because of this scripture, I studied the tail of a crocodile. You know what the tail of a crocodile is made out of? Pure muscle. Pure muscle. And the tail of a crocodile helps the crocodile to navigate and to move forward. It can operate like a propeller. And you know what the Lord says? In these last days, what will take out many men and women of God are things that are hidden in secret that we don't deal before Almighty God. You know what will take down many men and women of God in these last days? When the church slander one another. In the front, you sound great. In the back, you kill one another. These are the wiles of the devil. The Bible says, and the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth so that when she bore her child, he might devour it. Confrontation. The devil is confronting those that are birthing generations. The devil is confronting those who are producing souls, producing disciples, leading people to Christ. Verse 5, and he says, she gave birth to a male child. It's not only speaking of boys, no. A male child, both sons and daughters. One who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. Speaking of what? You know what is going to come is a generation who will walk the full authority of Jesus Christ. But her child was caught up to God and to his throne. You know what this speaks of? The Lord says, that's why we are being prepared to be a supernatural people. There will rise up a people, a company, an army, a generation that will behold the throne of God. And we will not operate with the weapons of this world, but we will operate with weapons that this world does not know. It can only come when we behold Him before His throne. Can somebody say amen? We are called to be supernatural throne beholding people in these last days. Amen. That's why we need to have revelation. If we are connected to the house of God, what you will have is revelation, not information. If you're not connected to the house, I asked you four weeks ago, what did Dr. Stephen preach? You don't know. Can somebody tell me? What did Pastor Stephen preach last week? It'll take a few moments for you to recollect. Even though I'm in Indonesia, I listen to the sermon. Especially members of Jesus Miking Church. When Dr. Stephen Francis is preaching, it's not another sermon. It is the word of the Lord for this house. If you treat his sermon just like another sermon, forget it. You'll never get connected to the spirit of the house. I'm in. Amen. Amen. You need to understand what is being spoken. Catch it in your spirit. It will begin to do something inside of you. Revelation is different from information. Information you can get from books. Information you can get because you listen to sermons and other people's preaching. But revelation you get straight from the throne room of God. Not because of a sermon. Because you open your Bible and you spend time with the Word of God and God speaks to you the hidden secrets. Remember Matthew chapter 16 and never forget that. Peter was praised by Jesus. You said I am Messiah, the Son of the living God. Man did not tell that to you, Peter, but my Father in heaven. Split second later. What did the Lord Jesus call Peter? Get behind me, Satan. Revelation, if it does not become a lifestyle and it does not birth God's assignment, revelation becomes an offense. The revelation that Peter received from the Father was so important. The Lord Jesus says, don't say it to the mass public first. I'll give you the scripture you read at home. Matthew Chapter 16, 
verse 20 to 23. But the Bible says, after Peter received that revelation from the Father, the Lord Jesus began to share to his disciples the suffering that he has to go through. The Lord Jesus was not able to openly share his assignment until Peter received that revelation. But the problem is, Peter received a revelation, but Peter did not know the heart of God. Peter did not know the assignment of the Lord Jesus. Do you know, church, you can receive revelation, but yet you're oblivious to the will of God. If revelation does not translate into assignment, if revelation does not change your walk, it doesn't change your direction, it doesn't change where you are going, it doesn't change your purpose, you know what? That revelation will only bring rejection to you. That's why a lot of people know how to talk, but their life doesn't exemplify anything. The moment somebody doesn't agree with you, what do you do? You get bitter. Right. Revelation is not meant for you to have a fighting point to argue with someone. Revelation changes you. Peter received a revelation, but it did not change him. And you know what's most dangerous? Peter loved the Lord. He did. Peter did not say anything wrong. He said, be far from you, Lord. Don't die. We love you. We want you. We will protect you. And a lot of people are in the church because of emotional feelings. Not because you're aligned to the will of God. If you're not aligned with the will of God, you can be in the church. Yes, man. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am, when everything is according to what you want. The moment it doesn't happen according to what you want, you backstep. Who said in the church there is no different opinions? There are different opinions. We are not robots. We are not AI. We are human beings. Amen. It is okay to have different opinions. But learn to talk with one another. Learn to accept, learn to release and learn to receive. Learn to accept yes and learn to accept no. The church of Jesus Christ is not fake. The, Lord, the church of Jesus Christ is not everything is kumbaya, everything is happy because we agree. Yes, yes. no. True love, you speak when you need to speak. You talk politely when you need to talk politely. When you don't understand, you say, I don't understand. But true relationship is forged when we are interested in the will of God. If you're not interested in the will of God, if you're not interested in fighting together, if you're not interested in the vision ahead, what will be, we become? We become only yes men in the church. When things are happy, we're there. When things are not so happy, we're the first people to leave. Can somebody say amen? amen? Can somebody say amen? amen? So don't allow revelation to bring rejection. Allow revelation to change our lives. The more you get revelation, the more your life is precise for God's glory. Amen? Now, look at the woman Hannah. 1 Samuel chapter 1. Sorry, 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 10. I want you to see something. God has been speaking to me a lot about the prophet Samuel. But I'll share many of it the next time. Prophet Samuel was one of the most revered prophet in the history of Israel. But you know, when I study the life of prophet Samuel, his birth or his encounter with God was not like Moses, you know. Burning bush. Not like Elijah, a man who came from nowhere. You can track Samuel's life from his birth. When he was born, no major star appeared. But he was simply nourished in the house of God. He grew up loving the house of God. He grew up honoring the house of God. That's why if you read in the book of 1 Samuel chapter 3, 
what Samuel experienced with God when God called his name Samuel, Samuel. Verse 7 of chapter 3 says, Samuel did not know the Lord and no revelation came to Samuel. You know, there are certain things that you and I can do for God without having to have revelation and supernatural experience. It's something called discipline and diligence. Samuel was built excellent, not because he had revelation, because his mother taught him the ways of God. And he learned as a child to grow up being faithful with what was presented before him, even if he did not understand completely why he was doing the things that he was doing. But it, he came about because of one mother by the name of who? Hannah. She's not just a woman. She was a prophet. How do I know? Verse 10. She prophesied of the strength of a coming king. During that time, Israel had no king. But Hannah was prophesying of the destiny of her nation. Hannah was prophesying of what is to come to her people. When you read the story of Hannah, Hannah is not a woman that was just wanting to win over the other lady called Panina. No. The Bible tells us specifically, Panina had many children. Correct? But have you ever read in your scripture, Hannah praying for many children? No. All she wanted was what? One son. Hannah was not fighting to win over Panina. She was fighting for her God-given destiny. Hannah was saying, you promised me a son. All I want is that. Hannah was crying not because she's trying to win in life. She was crying not because she's trying to prove herself. I am better than my husband's other wife. Hannah was travailing because she wants God's will to be fulfilled. If Hannah wants to win, then Hannah could have prayed, give me more sons and daughters than Panina so that I will become the number one. That's not Hannah's prayer. She said, give me a son and I know exactly what I will do with this son. I know exactly the vow that I'm going to make with this son. Hannah was so zoned in, focused into God's purpose in her life. You know something interesting about Hannah? If you don't know, look, look at this, look at this, okay? 1 Samuel chapter 1 now, verse 2 to verse 5. I'll give you the back story. And I'm telling you, why must we be connected all the generations? Because what you do today affects the life of other people in your life. I am inspiring the fathers and the mothers here. Don't stop fighting for your children. That's why don't baby your children. Fight for them the right way. And say, Lord, you visit them. You visit them, Lord. Because remember, God wants your next generations. In this church in Shelby, there is many who are here, part of our family. Our fathers, mothers, even grandparents. Then let's pray for the next generation to rise up. Let them see an example whom to follow. Remember, at that time in Israel, there was a priest. His name was Eli. And his sons, Hophni and Phinehas, was doing what was evil. You know what was absent in the life of Hophni and Phinehas? A mother. And the Lord showed me, these last days generation will be lost if God is not going to find a church who will function like a godly mother. You will pray and travail to birth God's plans and God's purposes. And I'm not talking just about women, you know. I'm talking about in the spirit, the role of a mother. If you're not willing to pay the price and to raise up the next generation, then what will happen? The next generation will be worthless because the sons of Eli was called by the scripture as worthless sons. No value. The back story, 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 2 to verse 5. Elkanah had two wives. The name of the one was Hannah and the name of the other, Panina. And Panina had children, but Hannah had no children. Verse 3, continue. Very interesting. Now this man used to go up year by year 
from his city to worship and to sacrifice to the Lord of hosts at Shiloh, where the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were priests of the Lord. Verse 4. On the day when Elkanah sacrificed, he would give portions to Panina, his wife, and to all her sons and daughters. Oh, are you ready? Verse 5. It says, but to Hannah he gave a... When I read this, I never saw it. And the Lord says, you know, how many people are like the opposite of Hannah? We get so distracted with God's blessings in our life. Hannah had no kids, but she did not only have one portion. What did she have? Double. But was Hannah distracted by God's blessing? No. But a lot of Christians in these end times are distracted by God's blessing. We don't care about God's vision. We don't care if our womb is empty. And I'm talking about us not producing anything for God's glory. As long as I'm blessed, man. As long as I have a house. As long as I have money. As long as I'm living comfortable, that's fine. But Hannah was not distracted because of God's blessing. Hannah had anything, everything that she could want. She had a double portion blessing. Even though no children, it is obvious her husband loved her more than the other woman. But yet Hannah cried and travailed. Hannah prayed because she was not consumed merely with God's blessings. She wants the purpose, the will of God to come forth in her life. Amen. Amen. Continue now. 1 Samuel 1 verse 9. We'll jump. But Nina kept on torturing Hannah. In verse 9, after they had eaten and drunk in Shiloh, the Bible says Hannah rose. Now Eli the priest was sitting on the seat beside the doorpost of the temple of the Lord. She was deeply distressed. Underline that. Church, I want to encourage you. If we want to be connected to God's will, God's purposes, how distressed are we in these last days? That we will not relent until, Lord, you open my spiritual womb, birth your plans in my life. And she prayed to the Lord and wept bitterly. Verse 11. What did she pray? And she vowed a vow. Somebody say with me, vow. When was the last time you made a vow to God? You always ask God to do something for you. When was the last time you say, Lord, I want to do this for you? A true prophetic church is a church who's unafraid to make a vow to God. I made a vow to God. Especially in the missions, I said, you give me Indonesia. Give me Indonesia, oh God. I'm a nobody in Indonesia, I tell you, nobody. But I said to the Lord, give me my country, Indonesia. So that a people will rise and they will know who the Lord Jesus Christ is. What vow have you made to God? Have you made a vow to God? Say, Lord, bless my hands so that I will do this for you. Hannah made a vow to God. And she said, oh Lord of hosts, if you will indeed Watch, what's the prayer of Hannah? This is the, uh, the three points I want to share before we close. The three points of Hannah. How do you get connected to God's plans and God's purposes? How do you connect it to God's heart? Hannah prayed and she prayed, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your servant. When Hannah said, O Lord, that you will look at the affliction of your servant, the word look, ra'ah, is the same word that Leah used when she birthed her first son by the name of Reuben. Oh God, I will name this child Reuben because you have looked upon my affliction. In other words, you know what Hannah was saying? Oh God, look at me. When you look at me, I don't want you to pity me. Look at me and give me eyes so I can see what you are seeing. Remember what Dr. Stephen preached? Be careful of spiritual blindness. We go to church, but we don't know. We cannot see what God wants to do. We cannot see what God wants to say. Pastor Stephen shared about St. Jerome. And he made a profound statement. 
he became blind because he was writing the scriptures for us and we are blind many times because we don't read the scriptures he carried a skull all the time you know why to remind himself that he's gonna die that before he die he's gonna fulfill that assignment are we racing with time we are you and I are racing with time. Don't miss the appointed time which God has for you and me. Amen. So point number one, you know what Hannah prayed? Hannah was asking, give me eyes to see. And that is critical. I believe in these last days, was one of the messages that God is saying, spiritual blindness is going to hit the church in the days to come. That's why God is saying now, ask the Lord to solve our eyes that we may see. A lot of people in the church will be blind. They don't know what's right. They don't know what's wrong. Now everything is mixed into worship. Some of the things out there in YouTube, what we call worship is not worship in the sight of Almighty God. And she said, and remember me and not forget your servant. I said, why did she pray those two different words? It sounds the same. She said, remember me and then not to forget your servant. Are you ready? So number one. If you want to be connected, remember, ask the Lord. Give us eyes to see. We need eyes to see. Number two, remember. The word remember in the Hebrew is the word zakar. Z-A-K-A-R. It means, you know what Hannah was saying to God? You remember your covenant, the promise that you've made with me, oh God. The key word in remember is covenant. Somebody say with me, covenant. Somebody say with me, covenant. Remember. Don't neglect the covenant that you have made with God. Ten years ago, five years ago, six years ago. Remember and fulfill the promises that you have made to God. And number three, the word forget in the Hebrew is the word Sarah, S-A-R-A-H, Sarah. One of the meaning of the word forget is wither. In other words, Hannah was saying to God, Lord, don't forget me. In other words, oh God, make me a life in you. I am not going to die. I am not going to wither. I'm not going to end my life in a way that does not bring glory to you. But God, I pray, make me so alive in you that when I leave this planet, I'll do something that will magnify your name. Can somebody say amen? amen. Hannah asked that God will give her life and zeal for her to be able to do great things for God. She asked for eyes to see. She asked God, remember the promise that you have made with me. So I tell you, you know what? Samuel did not just appear just like that. God has promised Samuel to Hannah. That was what Hannah was fighting for. Your promise, oh God. And number three, life. Hannah asked, make my spirit to be alive. Church, are we alive in these days? Are we active for God or not? Do you know that more people are committing suicide? More people are dying because of depression and oppression. Even before I left the house this morning, I got a phone call. Someone who was going through medical school. I met this guy in Jakarta on fire for God. He grew up in his family, a Catholic. But then he met Christ. I'm not talking about the Catholic as a religion. But he realized that what he had all this while was religion. He wants something that is alive in God. And he's beginning to give his life. Something's happened this morning. And he said, I want to commit suicide. Do you know how the devil this day is so easy to convince the life of many young sons and daughters to end their life. But you know what? The church in these last days will walk in the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we will give that life to a dying world. Somebody say amen. amen. And Hannah promised, you give me that son. And I will give him to you for the rest of his life. A major prophet in Israel was born because of the commitment of one woman. Can somebody say amen? amen. Hannah gives us hope that if God will not do that great thing in your life, He will surely do it in the life of your children and grandchildren. But there is a part that God wants you to play. And we need to understand what is it that He wants to impregnate us with in these last days for His glory. Don't be an empty Christian. 
You go to church like a shell. You come out like a shell. You come back in like a shell. But be filled with God's purposes. Have a reason why you come to church and why are you travailing. Have a reason why you are praying. Have a reason why are you crying out to God. Have a reason why are you worshiping. And don't let God go. Until Lord God, you fulfill what you said you want to do in my life. Can somebody say amen? amen. And the last scripture I want to give you. In the same passage, 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 27 to 28. Somebody say with me, I will give my best to God. If you're connected to the heart of God, you will always want to give the best that you have for God. The best of your time, the best of your effort, the best of your words, the best of your everything. I love what Hannah said and it baffles me because she said, For this child I prayed and the Lord has granted me my petition that I made to him. Verse 28 it says, Therefore I have... As long as he lives, he is lent to the Lord and he worshiped the Lord there. Why did the scripture use the word lent? Hannah realized everything that she has, she was merely borrowing from God. She did not hold tight to anything in her life because she knows every good thing in her life comes from the Lord. But at the same time, she took ownership of God's blessings. She didn't just give Samuel, here! Samuel was given to the temple after he was three years old. Hannah did not have this mentality. Okay, that's it. I'm done, God. You know what Hannah did? Year after year, she made a cloak, an ephod for Samuel. Year after year, year after year, year after year, year after year. Hannah's mentality was not, you give me a son, I'm happy, I'm good, there you go, have him. She nurtured Samuel and she made sure that Samuel will grow up to be the man that he's supposed to be. Will you take ownership of every blessing that you have in your life? Take ownership, but yet ownership does not mean you hoard it for yourself. Ownership means, Lord, yes, this is a great blessing in my life, but it's yours. You can use whatever you want. You can have whatever you want. As long as this child lives, he lives not for me. He lives not for himself. He lives for you. Somebody say with me connected. Somebody say with me connected. We need to be connected with his spirit. Connected to what is in the heart of God. Connected to be in the mind of God. I pray Jesus, my King Church, we will not be empty shells who comes to church week after week. Wanting to be served all the time. People have to understand me all the time. People have to make me happy all the time. But you come to this house to contribute to the bigger picture of God's plans and God's purposes. Amen? Amen. Let's rise in the presence of Almighty.